the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Dear brothers and sisters, as we continue in this season of the Incarnation, these great feasts where we celebrate Emmanuel, God with us, the Feast of Nativity, of Circumcision, and yesterday the Feast of the Baptism of Christ, we continue to read in these early chapters of Matthew, where over and again we find this formula that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by the prophet. We've seen this over and again, and last week we reflected that this was not merely some kind of checklist established ahead of time, which people were expecting to be fulfilled in order to identify who was the Messiah, that he should fit all of these criteria, all of these principles, all of these expectations. But rather, each and every time Matthew says this, it's an invitation for us to sort of use that link to guide us back into the full story of Israel. In fact, Matthew is writing to an audience that would have known that story. They would have known it backwards and forwards. They didn't need a further invitation to sort of click on that underlying text and find their way back into the fuller story in order to figure out what it is he was saying. And so too this morning, this story that after the baptism of Christ, indeed after his 40 days in the wilderness, we find the Lord beginning his ministry in Galilee. And Matthew specifically references this verse from Isaiah about the Galilee of the Gentiles, about the light that comes upon those who sat in darkness, those who sat in the shadow of death, the light has come upon them. In order that it might be fulfilled, it's not simply to say, well, that's what we were expecting the Messiah to do. He would come to Galilee and begin his ministry there. So often we cut the gospel down to size, we cut the church down to size, we cut down what our Lord has come to propose as his saving project down into something quite small, quite indescript. We imagine that this light that comes into the darkness becomes some sort of private illumination some kind of salvation limited to those few who happen to accept it and maybe then join into some kind of probably secret society living amongst the world with this new knowledge, this new understanding and illumination. We understand the church as some kind of small part of the world in which those who have the truth can gather borders set up around it to protect it, and it can sort of bide its time and wait out until some final deliverance. This light that comes upon those in the darkness, a private light. And as I say, the church and the project of our Lord become this kind of indescript, incognito even, project amidst the life of the world. It sort of exists the way what those Soviet sleeper agents did for many years in America, right? The KGB placed these people in the, the normal society. They weren't supposed to stand out. They weren't supposed to look any different from anybody else in the world. But one day, perhaps, they would be activated by the, the authorities in order to do something. And so the church sort of exists in the world. Nobody can tell who's a Christian any more than anybody else. We live, we have this privatized illumination, we have this secret society that we belong to. And there it is, right? The Lord has come into the world simply to set up sleeper agents of some kind. And yet, if we click on this hyperlink text in the Gospel of Matthew, what do we find? We find ourselves in the heart of one of these beautiful passages in the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah, who time and time again spells out a much bigger story than that. A story that, yes, acknowledges the world for what it is, a world that is corrupt, a world that is distorted, a world that is not living up to the expectations of God and his creational purposes. 
a world in which there's war, a world in which there's hunger and poverty, a, war, a world in which oppressive powers seem to rule and vulnerable people don't have much of a chance. It's a world Isaiah acknowledges, and yet again and again he tells a different story, a story that, of a God who's already at work to do something rather different. And so too, in this specific passage of chapter 9 of his prophetic book, as we read last night at the vigil, we have these words which come to us at this time of year. They're familiar to us, but perhaps we don't recognize their full import. It's a story of light that comes upon those in darkness, a story of a child who is born, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, Isaiah says. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And he goes on to spell what kind of story this is. Of the increase of his government, of his rule and his peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, as was expected in God's covenant with David, he would raise up such a ruler, and upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This is the story of a new type of regime, a new reign, a new kingdom that has come to be in the world. And that kingdom will increase, will grow, and will overthrow all the tyrannical powers of this world. It will finally put an end to those wars. It will solve the problems of humanity, of poverty and hunger and injustice. It will overthrow every oppressive power and replace it with a permanent and peaceable kingdom. That's what is coming to happen. That's what Matthew would have us know of our Lord starting this ministry in Galilee. And that's what makes sense of our Lord's words, the very first words which come out of his mouth, which echo the words of his forerunner, John. Repent, for the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is at hand. This is what's happening. If you have the eyes to see it, this is what you know is already taking place. And how big a project is this? Is this a simple thing about picking and choosing certain individuals amidst the world and forming from them these kind of sleeper agents who will act incognito and, and in secret in order to form something called a church that one day will be delivered out of the darkness of this world? No, it's not what the story's about. In this repent, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand. Our Lord, like Isaiah prophesied, is making claim to every square inch of the world. Every part of creation is part of this kingdom plan. From this time forward, and this is the meaning of our Lord plunging himself at the hand of John into the Jordan River, creation united to its creator. Every part of the world is being reconciled to the life of God. As St. Paul says in the epistle to the Colossians, it pleased God that the fullness should dwell in the Messiah, Jesus, in order that all things would be reconciled. Hang on to that word, all. All things. Not picking and choosing, finding the things that might believe the right things, or might act according to certain rules and principles in the world. Every part of time and space, every event, every individual, and every part of creation. As St. Maximus the Confessor tells us, Theosis is not only for human beings, it's for every part of the created world. All things will be called to share in the glory and the life of God. When our Lord Jesus enters the river Jordan at the hand of John, he's embodying first and foremost the people Israel, who by their passing through the sea were brought out and were formed into the people of God. And here 
our Lord as Messiah of Israel fulfills that story, but in it extends it now to become the fullness of the promise to Abraham that the whole world would be blessed through it. At the end of the service today, we will bless what? Is God interested in taking and picking and choosing some part of the water of the world and making it into something called special water or holy water or water that is different from the rest of creation pulled out of the world in order to be over and against the rest of the world? No, listen to the prayers of that service. Listen to the glorious proclamation that God has claimed every part of creation for himself, and he, it is his desire and a desire that will not be thwarted to rule every part of the world. And so therefore we take a representative part of that creation and we bless that water, but through that we redeem the purpose and the nature of all water, and through that the nature and purpose of all creation. We, through this, all of the adverse and opposing powers of God are put down in the icon of the Feast of the Theophany, which we see here today. It's represented by those figures of the dragon and the river God in the river. And we proclaim that in the service of the blessing of the water, that those dragons, those opposing powers and forces are put to naught, are put to nothing are put down and trampled on. And this is what it means to be a member of God's covenant community, to know this and to live this. And every part of our life needs to be formed and shaped by that realization. How often we live our faith as though it's some kind of private illumination, some sort of participation in a secret and non-visible society in the world. We should rather be living our whole life as a proclamation of this victory over every opposing power, this victory and this claim that God makes to all of creation. We should go from this place and in every part of our lives live here and now the future reality of that kingdom. Why do we love and forgive others? Not because it's a rule that we must follow in order to belong to some society, we love and forgive others because that's the end of all things. And we are already gifted to see that end when we come here and we celebrate the services of the church, especially divine liturgy, when we participate here and now in the end of all things. We have been made partakers of God's creational purposes for the whole world. And we ought to live and to, to, to fulfill our lives today in that way. Let us not ever be though among those who cut down the church and the project of God to this small thing. Even those Orthodox who say, well, the Orthodox is the one true church and isn't it great we belong to it, have cut the church down to something which is minuscule compared to what it's supposed to be. In the liturgy of St. Basil, which we celebrated in the Nativity and in the Circumcision, of the Lord, we hear these beautiful words about the one holy Catholic and apostolic church being from one end to the other of the whole universe. That's the church, not this society that we belong to that may be better and truer than every other society and isn't that grand that we belong to it, but rather the project of God to redeem all things and to claim all things for his sovereign rule. So as we celebrate, continue to celebrate this feast of his baptism, of his theophany, of the revelation of that project and plan to the whole world, let us not be cowardly, let us not be fearful, let us not be anything other than those ambassadors for the end of all things, God's kingdom, in which all and God is all in all. Amen.